The whole creation over here, it's us. It's not the creator wakes up one day and says, you know what, I'm bored, you know. Each one of us has a piece of the puzzle. The tikkun, actually, the correction, is taking that piece of the puzzle that we have and putting it in its proper spot again. Perfect. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, it's part two, so uh, definitely there is a, an increased desire of people to know more. So thank you for those of you watching who actually comment and, and, and send us uh, a lot of uh, desire to know more. Yeah. So um, we see a lot of uh, desire. There's also part three and four and, and, and more. Today I have a different approach to this interview and I want to go in the direction of understanding the fundamentals behind Kabbalah because the thing that I found the most fascinating about Kabbalah and what actually hooked me into that wisdom was that there was always an answer to a question. If you have a question, there is an answer. You might not agree with the answer, but at least there is an answer. Where I think in a lot of other practices, in a lot of religions, you don't really get any answers other than this is what the book says. But in Kabbalah, we actually have ways to understand the depths of not just why we're here and where we're supposed to go, but where we actually came from. The problem is, it's not an answer that is easy to give or to respond and the Kabbalist is usually going to answer the answer that is really uncomfortable to hear, you know. So it doesn't mean it has to be harsh or difficult or, or, or mean or, or discriminating or feminist or any of these, you know, yeah. areas of life. But the answer is not always easy answer. Well, that's kind of what my point yeah. was, is that you might not agree with the answer. Yeah. You might not like the answer. But exactly. at least there is an answer. Yes, that's the, that's the point. We're not getting I don't knows or, you know, replication of information from a book. Exactly. We're actually trying to get to the source of the information. Exactly. This is a, a need of investigation of each one of us. Because the one thing I want to make sure everybody understand... Do not believe anything I'm saying over here. Again, I'm yeah. saying it over and over. You got to check it for yourself. Okay, don't be robotic or just, oh, they say it or they, this guy say it or that person say it. No, no, no. You got to find it for yourself, you know, and that's what I would encourage people to. And also at the same time, just expressing that I feel like people who are coming into a spiritual space or a religious space, the major questions they have is, where am I coming from? What is God? And what is my purpose here? Mm -hmm. and, and, and this actually, this is answers. These, these are answers to those questions. Again, but again, you're correct that, you know, we're going in a direction that is going to be hard for the average person to lock onto this and be like, oh, I want yeah. more of this. Yeah. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. And, and there is endless amounts of study that can be done around these concepts. Yeah. So for, for me personally, I, I've been studying Kabbalah um, as a layman. I'm not, I'm not a rabbi. I'm not a teacher. I, I'm, I'm actually, you know, I'm out in the world on a secular level. But I, after studying this for 12 years, my real... Uh, focus on it is understanding the series of events that led me to this place in my life. And by understanding the series of events that led me to this place in my life where I'm right now, I can now backtrack myself. Mm -hmm. is that, is that, does that make sense? Yeah, of course. Okay. The thing that I want to bring up is that even if you are a Catholic or you're Christian, which I'm neither of those things, but even if you were Catholic or Christian and you are following the path of, of that religion, from my own personal experience in studying New Testament, I would not be able to extract a fraction of the information that I can from the New Testament without this knowledge. And no question. So again, it goes back to something you said too, which is it doesn't matter if you're this or that or the other thing. Kabbalah is for everybody to some degree. The study of Kabbalah is for everybody because even if you're locked into a religion, this understanding provides you with a background that allows you to understand the study that you're currently in. And you don't have to limit yourself to anything. You can do what feels right to you and you can participate in what feels right to you. But my personal perspective and opinion is that I would not be able to extract information from other teachings the way that I am able to without this information. So what it tells me about this wisdom and about this information is that this is the seed. And so if you're not studying Kabbalah, 
you're not studying the seed. You're not at the seed level. You're just on the surface, skimming the surface. You haven't gone deep. And I feel like most teachings are that surface level. It's like where your head is just popped up against the water. Mm -hmm. and, and in order for you to really get to a place where you even understand, why am I in the water? Why is my head above the water? What's going on here? You need this kind of understanding behind it in order for you to make sense of it. So that's also why I'm going into this too, because at the same time, you might be practicing something spiritual or religious but at the same time if you don't have this kind of understanding and wisdom behind it in my humble opinion you're really missing the largest piece of the you cannot finish the puzzle without this in my personal opinion I have no doubt about it I've, like you I, like I said before traveling getting to know all forms of uh, you know religion practices or spiritual practices yoga all of that it's really great, don't get me wrong, I really liked everything, you know, but none of these gave me everything in the same funnel. Right. Know? And that's what I found fascinating. Kabbalah actually supports an understanding of the creation process and, and how we became sentient beings. So I want to go back to the beginning, which we understand to be Bereshit Bara, right? That's, that is the beginning. When we talk about the beginning, we're not necessarily talking about the beginning of creation of man we're talking about the initial reaction of what the vessel had to the light i'm going to attempt to expedite the the viewer's understanding of these concepts through a series of statements that i would like you to respond true or false to if the response is false then you can expand upon it so first is uh the creator not just has but is the desire to share and wants to impart that correct and so that causes God to create a vessel, a desire to receive, in where God can impart that endless desire to share to the one soul, to that vessel. And so God creates a desire to receive. True and false, right? How, how false? False in a way that there is no desired, actual desire to receive in the energy of the Creator. It's almost like a hoax that has been created that we will attempt or think that we want to receive. But that's why God creates a vessel. A vessel is a desire to receive. Right. So, so to go back to the, because uh, I, I kind of said that fast. God creates a vessel, a desire to receive, in where God can impart that endless desire to share to the one soul, to the vessel. So God has to create a desire to receive. Yes and no. Okay. Yes, that is all in the force of the Creator, in the force of light, right? But the idea here is that it's not really uh, exists in the Creator to receive. It's only giving. Right. So the way the way the Kabbalists describe it is that tremendous desire to give, create. A funneling of where it can recipient or being used in a in a you know in a, in a, in a large or expedited or expand uh, expanded uh, way. So the creator not just has but is the desire to share and wants to impart that. Yes, light is the substance of endless fulfillment which permeates this created vessel. Yes. God has to create an extension of God in order to receive. So here's my question. Technically, is God giving to God? It's all light. It's all the creator. There's no, you know, we are, it's like a, the, the, we describe it like if you take a rock out of the mountain, right? Mm -hmm. So now it's not the mountain. But if you put this rock back into the mountain, it's considered to be a mountain, right? But these have the same exact mineral that exists in the mountain you brought it from, right? So the fact that you cut it off from the mountain and brought it here, so it, it means it's separate from the mountain? Yeah, in physicality, we have an axe that cut it and separated. it. But in reality, everything that exists in the mountain exists in this rock next to me, right? Right. The same thing. You know, so how do you separate souls? How do you separate, you know, light? 
it's very it, almost impossible unless you create, you know, what we call in the language of Kabbalah, a curtain, a, a divider, almost like an invisible divider that allow me to think or feel that I'm separated, but in truth, I'm all, we all one. Yeah. God has this desire to impart because that's what God is, but there's nothing to impart to. So God creates a vessel which is exterior to the endless, the ain't so. Yeah. So God creates this vessel and starts to fill it with endless light. Is that the correct terminology? Okay, yeah. Light is the substance of endless fulfillment which permeates the vessel. Correct. So God now fills this vessel completely with pretty much any desire you could possibly have is fulfilled. Exactly. God did not give to that vessel its own desire to impart. So the vessel does not, was, God didn't give the vessel a desire to share. This is the, the, ves, the actual energy that all of us are made of. Yeah. Or you're saying, you know, embedded within us is only the desire to give. The, what the, was created is a desire to receive. The desire to right. share, it's an inborn, we are, this is who we are. The desire to receive, right, the vessel, that's what hides or block us from share, like really experience the light of each other. So I, I guess what my question is, is that in the creation of the vessel and filling it with endless light, with every desire you have is, boom, taken care yeah. of. The one thing that God did not insert into that vessel was the vessel's desire to share. No, because the, the, well, because this is already a, a built-in. This is who we are. The desire, you know, there is a verse that we say in every day. Yotzer or uvore choshech. You know, there's a blessing that every day we say in that the Creator form yotzer or it means forming light. The Bore Choshech is creating darkness. So you see Yetzirah and Bria, forming and creating. So we know what is the only creation is the creation of darkness. And just to mention that, because you just said uh, Yetzirah and Bria, which are two of the four worlds. Yes. So in, in Kabbalah, we have four worlds. Yeah, we like to call it the four phases of our vessel, right? Which are represented and by the Yud K Vav K. Exactly. Okay, we're not going. We're not going. No, we're not going. We're not there. going there. But the point is, light is using the word forming, which means for you take one thing and you form it to something else, which means you create something from something. I guess we're not. I guess this over because it is an important po uh, important yeah. point. The initial desire to share wasn't there in the vessel. It it grew. It it, ca it came on its own. No, no. This is this is our essence. This is who you are. This is who you are. The desire to share. What was created is a desire to receive. So the vessel didn't develop its desire to share. It of was, course not. It, it was just, already there. So it, God did give the vessel a desire to share. This is. Our godly feature, the desire to impart, the desire to influence, the desire, but it's all hidden. You can ask anyone, anyone in this world, that they ever had a thought to share with somebody. Yes. Do you have a thought to really, you know, create something? Yes. Everybody have that desire. It's an inborn desire. What hides that, what the new creation, the whole creation is the desire to receive. That hides, that covers all our light, which is the desire to share. That's the creator part of us. The vessel's desire to share and desire to earn the light that it's receiving in the vessel results in what's called a contraction. Yes. Can you summarize that concept just a little bit for me? Yeah, it's very simple. It, because Kabbalist doesn't speak about somewhere out there. It gives you exactly how this world look like. So you know you have children. If you're going to keep giving them everything, 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 eventually they become a little spoiled, right? And eventually, you know, they're not going to move until you give them something, right? And eventually they think, I don't need to go anywhere. My, my father should pay for everything, right? right? And eventually that kid growing up, 
as you said, you know, sometimes some some kind of them have like attitude or the their muscles of 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 the, the you know it's not that strong the backbone is not strong they don't have the personality is weakened they become dependent right so we know kids growing up with with this type of mentality eventually you know they have no desire right because you give them away everything so obviously when when each one of us would love to know that we're earning where does it come the idea of earning everything is is for free the rocks are out there in the you know why should I pay you? It's always right there, right? Even even spirituality, people under the impression it should be for free. What do you mean for free? Free, it's exactly uh, uh, worth what you pay for. Nothing, nothing. That's what you get out of something you get for free. Now, what I'm saying is that the desire to earn is not really that based on, you know. Uh, hours and money or, 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 or some kind of work I'm going to give a, 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 a in return. It's effortless. There's effortless? no effort on the part of the vessel at this point. It's just receiving. It doesn't have to do anything in order to receive that light. Wait, which stage are you talking about? We're leading up to this contraction, right? Where, where the vessel has, and again, to, to, to define vessel very clearly, it's just a containment system like a glass. Okay. So God creates a containment system that God can put the light into. Mm -hmm. But inside of that vessel is the one soul, which is the thing that is receiving the okay. light. Right? Yeah. That one soul, which is now us, very fragmented, but that originally is us and where we're coming from, mm -hmm. that one soul decides, I may be using the wrong word there, but the one soul decides that it wants to earn the light that's coming into the vessel. It doesn't want to just being pumped in for, as you said, free. It's not that it doesn't want to. The idea is, if you think about it, you know, if we are in a pool of water, right? Pool of water. Yeah. Drinking water. And I'm telling you, hey, you want some water, like you and I, uh, like, let's say 600,000 people in a pool. Everybody in the same water. And I tell you, you want some of my water? And he says, no, no, I have. It's the same water, right? I, I can give you, uh, take, take a little bit of my water. No, I have it. It's the same thing, right? So we could not, what in the stage that you're describing right now, the souls, which were called the vessel, which we call the oneness, one soul, were in the same pool of water. That if I wouldn't want to give you any fulfillment, you says, no, I have it already. Yeah, but let me give you this. We say, I already have it. And you want to... So we could not share because we already have everything. If I take this glass of water, right? So I put it in a pool of water. Now it's disappeared. But still, there is a space where I can feel it, my thing or my water in a way. So water represents, in a way, all the fulfillment, right? So now I feel I can fill up my vessel and it's divided from the other one. You, you understand the idea? And therefore, when, when we were as one soul, there was no any ability for me to share. Therefore, that division, what you call the darkness, or the fake illusionary darkness that was created. So now, I feel I can, I can give, and you know, the person feel like when they can influence with me with rocks, and I can give wisdom, and this guy can give a cell phone, and this guy, you know, this guy can make a table, and, we f and, and this is how we starting uh, uh, the feeling of participating in creation or influencing in the creation. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. But I guess where we can kind of, where we kind of have to go back now is we're talking about a one soul, which is one yeah. consciousness. So how can the one soul, which is a one, one consciousness, want to share with each other? Because you're making it sound to some degree like there's an individual consciousness in there there's multiple consciousness in the one vessel yeah but for example take a human body like i, I shared it last time yeah you know sometimes if one hand is in pain you take the other hand and you massage that hand right so, but wait why can't that hand already tell uh, let's repair it right the idea of one organ taking care of the other right the same thing it's in the same body the hand doesn't feel it's different than that hand but if this hand need help i will help right 
in the endless or in original vessel that's the same idea the same place but you know the hand did, didn't need the help uh, you could not give me because already you know I do it by myself with consciousness right so this illusion that was created is for us to have the ability that we participating you know or feel the participating in in creation at that point the vessel wants to share but, yes but but it, it can't share with the creator it can't share with God exactly so it has to only share with itself yes there's something called the contraction and the first topic I want to discuss with you is is that contraction uh, a term described in Lurianic Kabbalah right yeah. which, which which is coming from the teachings of the Ari the yeah. Rabbi Isaac Luria uh, as Tsimtsum Tsimtsum yeah which translates as contraction. Contraction or the withdrawal of the light from the vessel. Right. So could you please explain Tsimtsum? In a very short uh, way, explain Tsimtsum. What we learn in, 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 in from, from the Kabbalists is there is a two concepts which is, has to, it's hand in hand. It's called Tsimtsum, which is the withdrawal of the light or contraction and Masach, which is curtain. Yeah. These two are hand in hand. It's together. What does it mean? For example, and I hope through examples of this world we can understand these, these ideas. If somebody, you know, is overweight and is always eating sugar, right? Yeah. He knows that he needs to cut it off, right? But he never do that continue with the addiction, continue with the habits, right? Which means he needed to stop it or do something of his own, right? To do that. He doesn't do it. Boom, he gets sick. Go to the doctor. The doctor, the doctor says, listen, you're about to, God forbid, you know, lose your life. You got to cut the sugar, right? And he says, okay, okay. If the doctor says, now I'm going to do it, right? This is what we explain to him too, which means, the person on his own needed to shrink his desire to receive for this type of uh, uh, habit that kills him, right? But he didn't do it. And then he created some kind of way blockage. And he goes to the doctor. The doctor says, now you have to. Now the curtain came down. Now you can't anymore. Do you understand? So the, the two ideas. So, so the symptom is voluntarily res resistance of the desire to receive for the self alone, which means the vessel says, I want to be like you, the creator. So I'm choosing almost to leave this greatness to be on my own. That's Tim Tsum. The vessel chose in a way, right? That desire to receive, separate that vessel from that light. That's called Tim Tsum. Does that make sense to you now? It, it, it does, the, but I, I have the I have I have masach the curtain coming. No problem, but we have to little. explain it in order to understand what tzimtzum. Tzimtzum is a voluntarily resistance of receiving. Right, it's a decision by the vessel exactly. to no longer receive endlessly. Exactly, the creator doesn't. So, so you know, it has to exit that vessel, the yes. Ain Sof, the endless world. Yeah, it has to exit. The, the Tsimtsum is essentially the process of the one soul leaving the endless. Exactly. Which is also associated with the vacuum. The concept of a vacuum. I mean, to, to some, I mean, again, for someone who's a little bit less familiar with Kabbalistic terms, I feel like you could kind of... Yeah, it's a vacuum, but the, that is the idea of the vacuum. Of the, when somebody, for example, you have people in your life, sometimes you are, they are very needy. Right? Yeah. It's like a vacuum. Mm -hmm. Right? So that need of that vessel, that's, that's what you refer to as a vacuum. I guess the way that I would associate it is like, let's just say here we have some dirt on the counter. Yeah. And I bring the vacuum over and I say, you know what? I want to remove the dirt that's here on the counter. We take the vacuum, we remove the dirt that's here, and now it's clean. But the dirt is still in the vacuum. Yeah. Now the dirt that's in the vacuum might say, oh my God, I really liked it on the counter. How do I get back to the counter? But there's a curtain 
there's an encasing now. Mm -hmm. there, there's, a, there's a pouch that holds the dust that's in the vacuum. And the dust is trying to figure out how do I get back to the counter? This is, is this sort of, again, trying to oversimplify for some. No, I understand the, the, the simplicity of that. I, I just want to make sure that even if you just stick to that, that idea that the vessel wanted to be like the creator, it's simply you drink coffee, the caffeine makes you feel a certain way. Yeah. Same thing. We're coming from an endless world. That endless world never leaves us. Even, but I'm not connected to it. And yes, we are so connected to it, but we don't have that feeling of that. We don't have that attachment to that. We don't have, we have, that is the idea of we wanted to be like the creator and that desire separates us to a reality. So in truth, the whole creation over here, it's us deciding to have that. It's not the creator wakes up one day and says, you know what, I'm bored, you know, let me create a world and let's play a game with these people, right? No. The creator never had that desire to create this world. It's the, cre the whole creation is the creation of the vessel. The vessel's desire for this, like your wish is my command. The creator says, what do you want? Create for me a world where I will be illusion of separation between us. So I can really utilize all those forces that you already gave me internally. The force of being an endless influencer. Yeah. That is what I need. I want to express this beauty that you put on me, in, inside of me. Then coming out of Simsum, which is the contraction, right? It's where the... Uh, yeah. One soul exits the uh, endless yeah. vessel. There, there's something called a residue, or, or also called uh, Rashimu. Yeah. Can you please explain what Rashimu is? Very simple. Um, residue. Residue is Rashimu, but it's also Rashima Kedusha, the, the, the holy in, engrave. So Rashima is almost, sometimes you can write things. This is like almost like engraving right you know Rashimo in in very simple terms is mold mold for example if you let's say for, if i take a, a i don't know uh, i take a, a rock right and i and i squeeze it strongly on the sand let's say flat sand or or, or, or soil or right. even like a foam let's it'll make an foam. impression it will make an impression a deep impression that, and that Will, let's say if I fill it with, uh, with any liquid or anything, now I have or gel or something, right? So now it gets dry and it had the mold of that rock, right? So that's the same idea. The Reshima, the impression that we have, can only be filled when we act as the creator in this world. Now the Reshima, now the mold gets filled. Now I feel my purpose. Do you understand? Would, would you say that this residue is the spark inside of us that reminds us, hey, you came from the endless? Yeah, exactly. It's a mold that constantly reminds us, I need to get filled, I need to get filled, I need to get filled. And right. all day long searching, where, where, where? You go to work, you, go, you, you, know, you sell some stuff, you feel good, but then I don't yet fulfill because, again, we think that you know, what we're doing in this world, it will fill the, that void that is waiting to be filled, that Rashimo, that impression, that, that mold that, that, that we have that residue from the endless world. The only way it can be filled is when you become endless, endless, endless. That's it. Now, most, how can I be endless? That's what we're talking about immortality. We're talking about, you know, endless influence, you know, and, and so forth. There's a, a restriction, there's a contraction where the one soul leaves the endless world and it enters into this vacuum, this, this space where there is a residue. Yeah. And the residue is basically the, uh, the push back where you came from. It's the, the remaining, it's the remaining in a way of what you took from the endless to remind you 
in this world who where you, you are it. and where you get it from and where you want to go back to. Okay. I might butcher this when I say it. Shevirat HaKalim? Yeah. Shattering of the vessel. Yes. Uh, it, did I say it right? Shvirat HaKalim, yeah. Shvirat HaKalim. Yeah. Describes how after the restriction, after the Tzimtzum, God created the, the vessels, HaKalim, in the empty space. Yeah. Can you explain this? Is, this is a tough one, I think. It's very simple. When you build a company, mostly in high tech, what people do, they put the company before they launch it into incubator. Right? You know business incubator? Have you heard it before? No, I'm not familiar. So with you this. come into an incubator in any most most high tech have that. You don't need that, you know. So and they bring in the you know many different you know uh, uh, specialists or many different marketing people you know to look at the company before they launch it. Right? So it's almost like a simulator before launching the company to see, let's say, for example, they're doing it actually with websites. You know, mm -hmm. let's say if you open a website, they need to check how much traffic that web website can handle. And so they're making a fake type of uh, 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 flow into your web website to see if you can handle and how many uh, viewers. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Same thing. Then you go into the world. The same idea, you know, the vessel the way it was, you know, it still didn't do the work of what we wanted to feel in this world. So that vessel, original vessel, had to be shattered and and obviously spread into, like, for example, you know, uh, the, the best description I, I have is from Rav Ashlag. He says, imagine I, gi I'm, uh, you know, I'm giving you a rock or I give you a diamond, right? Yeah. A huge diamond. And I tell you, you have 30 days. I want you to clean it. I want you to, to shine it. I want you to give me from that, break it into many of them. I want to I, I, I work on that. I want you to shine that and make it perfect. So you say in 30 days, it's going to be so hard. You know, even if I'm going to work 24-7, I won't be able to do it by myself. Right? So, okay. So he said, okay, cut it. And give, give it to so many people to do that. Can you do it in 30 days? Yes. If I have 100 people, I cut it to 100 pieces. Now each one of them can do it. We can finish the job in 30 days. Same idea. The first original vessel got so much light to work on, it was impossible for him in a, in a 6,000 year process to finish it. So that vessel, that diamond need to be shattered, which is called Shevarat. Shvirat HaKelim, yeah, exactly. Okay. Therefore, each one of us receives a spark of light that is being divided for each one of us to work on, right? To get the best out of it, to shape in it, to clean it, to clear it, right. cleanse it. So, so in order to accomplish this extremely large task, we're dividing the work exactly. into separate vessels, which exactly. is the shattering of the one vessel Perfect. into many, many vessels. And then each one of those shards of the vessel Get a little gets spark, a, little, a little diamond to work on. This is your work and you need to do it. Perfect. Okay. And by the way, it's not just that. It's divided to families, communities, cities. That's why, why you think it's structured this way. It's all its own spark that needs to work on. This now leads us into tikkun. Yeah. Right? Which is known as correction. So when, when the Kabbalist says tikkun, what they're talking about is a correction that needs to be made. Yeah. So tikkun, which is correction, is the process of gathering together and raising the sparks of God's light that were carried down with the shards of the shattered vessels, right? So, so tikkun, okay. tikkun is your work that was assigned to you as this vessel. Yeah. So there's a shattering of the vessel, now it's in pieces, and then each piece gets its own tikkun, exactly. its own correction, right? But it really, it's not necessarily a correction, is it? It's more like a series of, you know, responsibility. Okay, so the literal word of tikkun is, as you said, correction, let the ken, to fix. Yeah. Now, the problem is that in this world, if I tell you, go and fix this and that, it means something is broken. You go fix it. That's not the concept of tikkun. Not because it's broken, now we need to fix it. Not because it's damaged, now we need to fix it. That's not tikkun. 
Tikkun is simply that we had everything. We're perfect. We just wanted more. So Tikkun is to adapt yourself from good to great. If you're great, be excellent. you excellent, be superior. you superior, be endless. So Tikkun is not in a bad way because when I tell you, oh, you need to do a Tikkun, oh yeah, you know, I'm bad. It feels negative. No, but that bad process is super positive. But Tikkun is also the way that we actually earn the light. Exactly. But it's like... Because again, we wanted to earn this light. Tikkun is to bring everything back to its source. For example, have you ever went to a chiropractor? Yeah. Why, what does the chiropractor do? He doesn't fix anything. No. He's it's just align back the bones. Mm -hmm. And the body fix itself. Is that correct to say? It depends on who you ask, but... I, I, I ask a chiropractor. This, the idea is, what are, it's not about them or this or that. It's about bring back the bones back to its origin and everything else will work itself out. The energy will flow and fix it. So in a way, it's like when you do tikkun, you adapt, you adjust your consciousness, and then everything will funnel into it. But you need to understand something, the reason I don't see something, or I don't get any certain fulfillment, or any certain uh, 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 desire to, to, you know, that I want, is because you need to adapt yourself into it. You, know, you understand? You need yeah. to transform yourself to be the, what we call like attracts like. And that's the tikkun. When I was writing all of this up, one of the things that kind of came to my mind, and maybe you can help me understand if I'm, if I'm close to accurate here, is uh, I, I was associating this with a puzzle. So you have a puzzle that comes out as one picture. Yeah. Someone then comes along, cuts the puzzle into a thousand pieces. Each one of those pieces is part of the original picture, original puzzle. But now it's our job to get the puzzle pieces back to their correct place. So a tikkun, the correction, is actually getting your piece of the puzzle. Each one of us has a piece of the puzzle. Yeah. And the tikkun, actually, the correction, is taking that piece of the puzzle that we have and putting it in its proper spot again. Perfect. Okay. One more example. Have you ever played uh, hide and seek? Mm -hmm. What is the game? few kids, I see my kids, right? You know, they go hiding in those nooks, right? Mm -hmm. And then the person is counting a few... And then they, what, do they, what do they need to do? Go look for them, right? How does the game over? You get found. You find you the person. Found, yeah. Right? yeah. That's it. Have you ever seen when you found someone when he's hiding, the excitement? Do you yeah. remember that? The excitement? I, 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 I do see that when my kids play. That's it. That is tikkun. When you found a tikkun, that's it. You, you just found it. You know, sometimes people have no awareness. That's what they're looking for. But, but finding it does not mean that you actually did the correction. That's 90% already done. Is, Just is to that, understand how is, much we already like there. Right. So the awareness that this is exactly. the tikkun, uh, the work that's need the, 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 most, the, the bulk of the work is finding out what the tikkun actually is. Exactly. I have a question to you. Have you ever stick your finger into the socket? No. And, and it, let's say, you know, a friend of yours comes and says, by, by the way, uh, you finish shower with the cool, with the water on your feet, right? Just take your finger, put it in the socket. <laughs> you never did it before. No. And for some reason, for some reason, you're not gonna do it. No. No, I, I'm not gonna. Do Just it. the awareness of that. You you never even try that. Already, you feel safe, right? Right. So the tikkun is just the awareness. It's just like. Wow, I know I have that shortcoming, I have that limit. Not saying that you don't need to work it, but just by bringing it to the surface, already changing the game for you. Do you right, understand? Right. It's like so protecting all what to do as well. Okay, so before I move forward into the next series of questions, I want to go back and summarize this for everybody. because we. Yeah. So first things first, there is a desire to impart by the Creator. Yeah. Right. This is, this is as far back as we can possibly go. Yeah. Right? There's a desire to impart that is coming from the Creator. That desire to impart then gets entered into a created vessel where the <clears throat> one soul exists, which is all of us, before the shattering of the vessel. Okay. We are now receiving on an endless level. But because we are 
filled with the essence of the Creator, we also want to impart. But we have nothing to impart to. So we shatter the vessel, there's a simsum, there's a vacuum, pulls us out of that endless light, puts us into an empty space, shatters our vessel into many different pieces, and then assigns each vessel a tikkun, a correction, a piece of work that it needs to do. And this is its way to earn the light. This now leads us into the idea of klipo, which translates as a shell or a husk. Can you expound upon that for us? Or a parasite. Is that what it is? That is that a new understanding, or that's always it's been? It's all we we like to call it the parasite because to understand its its own idea of that, you know. I want to get a basic understanding of what is klipa. Just klipa a ba- is a shell, it. in a way, very simple. Uh, any fruit cannot really grow unless it grow its shell first, and then the fruit grows inside. Right and expand from within. So a shell, it's a temporary structure to allow the vessel to grow. But at some point, if you don't peel the clipa, the shell, in its time, it eats the fruit, like an orange or an apple, a or, right? Like a parasite. Like a parasite, it's eat its own uh, self and then die. Then. You know, obviously. So the concept of Klipo, just maybe, maybe I can. Uh, the concept of Klipo is that I need an environment. Exactly. I need an environment to be able to do my tikkun. Exactly. And the Klipo provides me that environment for me to exactly. do my tikkun. The problem is, is when I'm not doing my tikkun, the Klipo then starts to take over. Exactly. Okay. My next question is then going to be about something you, was, you started to touch on, which is the masach, which is the curtain, yeah. where, uh, which separates the four worlds. Now, this is a topic that we could go talk about this forever, but let's try to uh, simplify such, such a crazy concept to understanding there are four worlds, and there's a curtain that separates those four worlds. Let's put it this way. There are five worlds. Well, the, the, is the the Ein Sof is considered the fifth? No, world? it's Adam Kadmon, the primordial man. We call it right? Atzilut, Bria, Yetzira, and Asiya. So it's Adam Kadmon, which represent again. It's not yet part of the vessel, but it's a reality, right? And the word realities also need to be uh, spoken about. It's not a real well, reality. Uh, well, just to refer, uh, Adam Kadmon is primordial man. The literal translation. The, right, the literal the, translation yeah, is but primordial it's not the, man. the primordial man. It's it, no, but, yeah. but the, the idea behind that... But it's come from the word kadam. Kadam is kodem, which what came first. That's what it means. It's a kodem, which means kadmon is kodem. is the, the first interaction with the vessel. Cool. All right. So, but then there, there's... It's like this incubator I told you earlier. Mm-hmm. That's the reality. So it's not the real reality. It's not... Any of the structure, but it's the the incubation period. Incubation period, period yeah. Okay. So, so what what are what are these curtains, and what purpose are they actually serving? You touched on it briefly before. So there are many of them, right? In each stage, you're gonna face a curtain. Now they use the word masach, a curtain, because the curtain is not a brick wall. They don't. They didn't ever call it. The Kabbalists never gave it a name of of a, of a rock. Okay, or, or an iron uh, 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 door, right? Right. Call it a curtain. Because curtain know that when the wind comes, it blows it off, right? Right? Wind is when a person is connected to, what is wind in Kabbalah? Ruach. It's a level of the soul that you elevate to, this is what you call ruchani, when you become spiritual. Ruchani is spiritual. When you start connecting to your spirit, then it's where you easier blowing off that curtain and then see what we call the sun or see the light or see what's out behind the window. Right. Do you understand? Yeah. So that is the idea of that's why you call it curtain. And when people remove the curtain and they really expose to the light, it's like almost like too much. Close it, close it, you know? So uh, for those of us who, who are more progressed spiritually, that curtain is not that thick. We have like a nice, uh, you know, 
thin see layer. Through, see through type of light. Still, it's dimmed well, it's a little like bit. Look, it's also like looking at the sun to some degree, right? Yeah. That's why you wear sunglasses. Exactly. Exactly. So it's, it's a similar concept to wearing sunglasses because the light of the sun is too bright for the raw eye to handle. Exactly. If the raw eye looks at the sun directly, it blinds it. It's too much for it to handle. So we need it's something. It's experience from. darkness. You, know? you always see dark spot in your eyes if you look in it directly. So I guess we can summarize a curtain to some degree as, imagine we took a light bulb. Yeah. and we put layers of thin yeah. curtains over yeah. it, it shields us from the blinding light that is already there. Exactly. But we have the capability to remove those curtains. That's or to the only thing you need to do, exactly. Bypass those curtains so it can bring us You closer. don't pass them, you remove them. You're not like going around yeah. it. You can't go around it. You cannot go around right. the curtain. You, know, you, you have to remove it. You can only go through it. Which means by removing one after the other, one blind brings us closer blinds. to that source of light. It again depends how much you can handle. That's how much you can remove. And how much you can handle is based on how you've built your vessel. Exactly. And your vessel is what's able to receive this light, which is essentially but receive the light without side effect. That's a different without story. short circuiting. Exactly. Without falling into, you know, a short circuit as you call it. Right? Yeah. Uh, so the, again, going back to understanding. So w we're we're in this process where we cannot handle the light anywhere near its direct capability. No. So we not need the way we are today as individual, but when we go back to a system that we are together, that's when we can handle. When you become really back and unified back again. That's when we can handle it. Right. So uh, I, I guess essentially what, what, what we need to understand is that there are four worlds. And it's something I do want to touch on because there's also yeah. four levels of the soul. Yeah. Again, I know you, you mentioned five and that's, but for our simplicity of the matter, yeah. I'm trying to stick with that four system, right? Which is the Yud Kei Vav Kei, yeah. which most people don't know, but is probably the most, which is called the Tetragrammaton, yeah. right? And it's, it's the most powerful name that we can actually get our hands on. Yeah. In the form of uh, Kavano. Yeah. In the form of meditation, in the form, form of, of the prayer, yes. Right. And what we need to understand is that as we work our way through this system of curtains going through, we're bringing ourselves higher in the spiritual dimensions, in the spiritual planes. So I, existing here in uh, Asiya, which is the f world that we're currently in. The world of action, yes. Right. We, we exist in this world of action, which is called Asiya, which is connected to the He in the Yud K Vav K. Yeah. We say K instead of H because we don't want to say the actual name yeah, of God. Yeah, that name is too strong to use it directly. Right, which could cause a short circuit, which, again, people are going to think, that now we're going yeah. in the direction of where people can start thinking crazy stuff. Yeah. But, but my point is, is that we are here existing on this baseline, fundamental world, right, where we have what's called the Nefesh, yeah. Which is the, here you go, soul, right? Here's the soul that you come with, you have it, it's there organically. Yeah. And then we're living in this world of action with that nefesh, with that fundamental baseline soul. Yeah. Our goal is to try to bring ourselves up in these levels, in the worlds and on a soul level, which are connected to each other anyway, yeah? Yeah. How, how do we do that? First of all, in order to understand... What you, you, because when you say something like that, it's it's important for people to to understand what we mean. Four worlds. What do you mean worlds? Yeah. So there's another world over there. It is like you're talking about the outer world. What, what is this? Uh, the underworld. What is the world you're talking about? Right. First of all, from a kabbalistic point of view, there is nothing out there. All of that happening right here, right here. Nothing is happening out there. So let's just take down the idea of like there's worlds. The language of Kabbalah explained to you a lot of what people reading it literally and thinking because Olam is world. Yeah. But Olam is also and important to know that the Kabbalist doesn't use it as Olam as world. Is use it as Olam as the word Ne'elam which is disappearing, disappearance. Ne'elam. 
Do you understand? Mm -hmm. It's from the word disappearance. So there are four levels of disappearance, right? Which mean, for example, uh, you as a child, right? It's almost like a reality that disappeared that was before. Correct. Right? But it's still here, yeah. right? Because that child is still here. But it feels like a but lifetime. But if there though. is a disappearance around, exa exactly. Or an old relationship that you dated, it's like yeah. it feels like the another world they lived in, right? You know what happened. You know it's there. Exactly, but it's, 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 it's far from a disappearance, right? So every time you elevate yourself spiritually by working on your tikkun, transformation of the desire to receive for the self alone to the desire to share which is the original reason of why you came here mm -hmm. you get to be elevated to another world what do you mean another world you've been exposed to another reality that was this seems like vacant or not there for you before but it was there but you could not access the way you were or the your functionality as a child or as a young adult or even as a mature person that is Sorry about my French, right? Lame in, in as far as like spiritual education. But when you educate yourself spiritually, when you take more responsibility, when you understand and recognize clipot, curtain, remove them, transform yourself, right? You get exposed to another reality. What is it, another world? A world that was already it was already here. It's there, you just can't see it. Yeah, it's like because you finding uh, gems. They are red. They are there. So, so to, to kind of just expound upon this, there are levels of consciousness, mm -hmm. right? There's levels of consciousness, and if we want to move ourselves or scale up those levels of consciousness, we need to essentially remove the klipa. Correct. That, and then we need to go through the curtains. Which Correct. are the levels of illusion. Correct. Right? So, again, we have to understand, we still exist in this world. The reality that we experience, although it is an illusion, but the reality that we experience is here in this world. But levels of consciousness can determine how we actually experience this world. Yeah. And if you want to experience experience the world closer to the actual concept of what it's supposed to be, you have to move yourself up these layers to actually understand, oh, this didn't just happen by coincidence. It, the difference is, is, oh, this is coincidence. This is just how things happen. My life is random. I can't have no control. I can do nothing yeah. about it. And as you move yourself up, you start to realize that you actually are, are, do have some sort of control based on the level of your consciousness. Yeah. So our goal essentially is to elevate our consciousness to a state where we are removing the desire to receive for the self alone, which is essentially selfishness. Yes, I would just adapt it to not removing but transforming. Do you understand? Yeah. For example, darkness. Mm -hmm. Right? My, my teacher is the best in this thing, right? Most of us, when we experience darkness or what you call, you know, a desire to receive for the self alone, selfishness, right? You don't dump selfishness, right? You transform it, right? To be selfless. Does that make sense? Yes. When you coming in, into this room. It was dark. The first thing you do is what? Turn the light on. Turn the light on. So the only question that we have is where the darkness goes. I just flipped the switch. Darkness gone. Right. Where is it? That's a very philosophical question that many people try to answer. And there's many scientific uh, answers to that. But my teacher, I think, have the best answer that I, I found satisfying for me. Right? So, if you ask anybody, where is the darkness? What would they tell you? Oh, it's in the light, or it's, it went... Where is it? Where, where is the darkness? Where did it go? It was filled the entire room. It became the light. It became the light. But where did it go? It's a philosophical question. Philosophical. The answer that my teacher gave is, I don't care. That's a simple answer. Mm -hmm. Why? You had, obviously encounter with cancer yeah right so imagine when cancer disappeared did you got concern where is it i want to see it i want no, to keep thank it. god it's gone so it's the same idea 
a problem in business or lots of problem but let's say uh, 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 some issue in IRS God forbid somebody else and then they call you oh no it's gone it's you know would you call back IRS no 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 I want it I want to no. keep it no. no when the darkness disappear nobody needs to be busy where the darkness go and no. that's what people do and the simple understanding of Kabbalah is when you switch the light on it doesn't mean that the room is nice Oh, pretty but you still you can now can see what needs to be done yeah. you can see what needs to move around you can see what can be fixed but not most of us are walking in the dark and thinking we know what we're doing so chaos darkness you know desire to receive for the self alone selfishness is the same idea but when people turning on that light doesn't mean everything is fixed but at least I have a direction Right. So the first encounter with Kabbalah is to first switch the light on. And then you can see what, what you're doing, who you are, what you're here to do. Well, to, to answer the question that you were asking me before, what, what about the darkness, uh, you know, I, I, I did have uh, an answer which is not as luxurious as uh, I don't care. But it, it is in the direction of, you know, it's no longer my concern, which is, I, I think, a similar kind same of thing is, is, is similar. But at the same time, what I was going to, I was trying to at the same time process how I was going to say that to you. My, my concern is no longer with that because my focus now needs to be on the light that I'm revealing. Yeah. If my focus is on the darkness, then I'm looking behind myself. Yeah, you're going to bring more darkness. That's right. it, where your focus is. Okay, light's on, now let's explore the room. Exactly. Right? I, I don't want to bring the darkness back. Now I actually can see what's going yeah. on in my life, which is the turning the light on. Is Oh, now it all makes sense to me. Now it's I, very I'm, simple, yeah. like in a way, even if I bring somebody new to this room, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to be pitch black over here. And in this room over here, the audience doesn't see it, but there's many rocks and many tables and different, different obstacles. So if I'm going to be in this side and you're going to be, uh, the other person, the new person comes to the room, completely dark, doesn't know the room, but he hear my voice, come over here. And it's completely dark. So he knows the direction he needs to go. But chances are he's going to bang into many things and hurt himself a few times or sometimes even damage things around the room. Does that right. make sense to you? Right, yeah. And they go through pain and more pain and more pain until they get to the voice. Right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to you're looking first of all to the switch. You turn on the light. Then you know how to navigate the room. So I, I guess really what you're saying here too is that more importantly than bumbling about the room in the darkness trying to figure out where you're going is don't even enter the room until you turn the light on. Yeah, and the room is your life. Right. Now we've explained the situation of the vessel and how it's gone through this process of shattering and tikkun and klipa and all of these other things. But we wind up in a place called Gan Eden, which is the Garden of Eden. Can you please explain how we got to Garden of Eden and what that actually is? When we're speaking about Garden of Eden, we also related to the six or seven days of creation, right? That that uh, the human, you know, Adam and Eve, born which day? Remember, which day they were in the creation of the world? When was Adam and Eve born? For those of you, was it the fifth know, day? It was the sixth day, Friday, Friday, and they had to be six hours until Shabbat energy comes in. Shabbat represents the energy of, of completion, right? What we call beyond the physical uh, 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 world, right? The complete connection to, to, uh, uh, to the endless. So, since you brought up Shabbat, I just want to mention that. So Shabbat, for me, the way that I would, I would explain it to a layman is that it's like filling up your gas tank. It's like it's in, like in you, one you, level, yeah. Right. So it's like you know, throughout the whole week, you're running off the gas that you have, the energy that you have, and when Shabbat comes around, it's your chance to refuel the gas tank. Uh, that's that that's what known to be in the religious world, or what they explain, you know, that you need to. What about if a person is retired and doesn't work? Well, I, I think that <laughs> it's, it's more talking about your, your six days of interaction with the world. So and that's how a different thing. That's a different yeah. thing. That's what you're saying in interaction. is not like, because people refer to, by the way, it's been, we growing up like that, you know. You work hard the whole week, 
Come Saturday, take a day off. Yeah, you know that's how we've been presented, it was completely wrong. Well, it's not. I mean, if you're if you're going to actually participate in Shabbat and keep Shabbat, it's, it's a lot of it's work. a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that's what refills the gas tank. A lot of the prayers in Shabbat, no, are essentially going into. I'm, that. I'm, I'm hesitant to answer you because I don't want people to take it in the way of like feeling a charge my battery. You know, we you can know. talk about it in the, yeah. in, in, in the future. But going back to the Garden of Eden. So Friday, Friday came, and and then the Creator obviously create a, a man, and then we know the story, uh, creating the woman, and they had to stay in Garden of Eden. What does it mean? In in again, without going into many many details about it, uh, um, why they using garden, why this and that. But the the concept is. They had the opportunity to stay connected to what we call the tree of life. Tree of life is, there's the two concepts, right? Tree of life or the tree of knowledge, good and bad. Which that's the reality that we fell into after the inability of Adam and Eve to sustain themselves in the tree of life for six more hours. Six more hours. That's the length of what we're talking about. So that's again. Let's go back to because that's that's the point that I was hoping you were going to kind of make. Yeah. Was that there really was only like that six hour window? It's not like we were they were out in the garden for like months and months and months. Yeah. It was a very very short period yeah. of time. They didn't know that. Well, they didn't know that they only needed to make it six, <laughs> yeah, six hours. Six hours, right? Yeah. It's like it's like when uh, when Moses came down when the Israel had created the golden calf. But, but can you explain how you get to that? That there was only six hours. How do we know that? By the description of the of of, of the Zohar. Okay, so that's information we're given by Rabbi Shimon. Yes. Okay. But but we we, we get to that we get to that understanding that there was only six hours to go, and all they needed yes. to do was just not partake in the eating of the fruit, which is the knowledge of good and evil. Yes. yes. So the Garden of Eden essentially was a template to say, Hey, listen, I'm going to give you six hours. Don't do this thing. If you don't do this thing, you earn the light. Yeah. If you don't do this thing, be- earning the light's going to become a lot more difficult for you. Is this is this accurate enough? Mm-hmm. Essentially, what we're talking about is God. Ga- Garden of Eden was the first test. Yeah. Of the shattered vessel. Yes. Exactly. Garden of Eden was the first test of the shattered vessel. Hey, this I- is the six hours that the Creator tell tell Adam Arishon, the first Adam. Here is the big diamond. You have six hours, make it great. So I'm going to make it in six hours, mm-hmm. right? You couldn't make it. Okay, we have to shatter that. And that's the idea of the concept. Okay. In the Garden of Eden, we see God calling out to Adam after eating the forbidden fruit. God's looking for Adam. And ultimately finding him naked and ashamed. Why does it appear as if God was unaware of the eating of the fruit at the time it happened, since God is all-knowing? Very simple. Um, a lot of uh, interpretation went into the idea that God threw out, right, expelled Adam and Eve from Garden of Eden. Right? That's the idea. Realizing they're eating from the fruit. I told you not to do it. Now... You kicked out. Get out of here, mm-hmm. right? Wrong. That was not happening. Why? Because there is no concept like that in the Creator to, you know, negative or punishment. You've been punished. There is no something like that in the Creator. Yeah. You understand? There's simply the distance or the closeness makes the difference. So, for example... This curtain. Exactly. So, what happened is... Adam and Eve needed to leave the Garden of Eden not because the Creator wanted them to was upset with them. It's because they felt ashamed and embarrassed. That is why they need to leave because they feel now I'm not des- I don't deserve to be here anymore. I, I didn't earn. Yeah, I, I don't deserve. The earning is after. I don't deserve being here. Right? The same thing, by the way, the same story we should know also happened in the golden calf later on you know generations generation later in the golden calf Moses in the mountain they came he also the Moshe 
Moses Boshesh Lavo. They thought Moses is not coming, but Boshesh is the word Shesh, which is six hours before he came, they created the golden calf. Right. And what happened? He says, Veitnatslu Bene Israel me Ediam Mehar Chorev. They lost all their what they call jewelries, which mean elevation that they that they earn and gain through the time over there. Mm-hmm. And they lost it because why? The God, the great Moses came and they felt so embarrassed and so ashamed and guilt. And and therefore that's why they lost us. That's why they had to leave the Garden of Eden. From the creator point of view, I'm okay with you this way. I'm, okay, I'm, I'm with you, no matter what. But because you feel ashamed, which means you fall into a negative place. You listen to the negative side. Because what is the idea? The idea is taking responsibility. And that is where the creator can stay with you, even if you are not yet perfect. But you are responsible for your action. A lot of people sitting with guilt. You know how guilty I feel? Is not enough? No, that's not a payment. Feeling guilt or feeling bad for your action doesn't change it. But if you learn from that and transform and, and realize, wow, look where I, where I am and where I can be, that the Creator can stay with. And that's the problem in Garden of Eden. And that's part of what is our tikkun, that continuously doing the same thing over and over. But, but I, I, going back to my, the question is, is, why was it that God was looking for Adam and calling out to Adam? Didn't God already know exactly what yeah, happened? Yeah, but they are in the same scenario. The Creator gives us many different scenarios that we can choose from. Now, we don't know them, but based on your action, that's where it goes. So when, when Adam and Eve chose that type of direction, now they are, you know, they've been calling out because this is what you chose. Do you understand? So it, it, it's, you know... Yes, the Creator can predict what Adam already will choose, but it gives the opportunity for, for us, Adam and Eve, yeah. to choose. Well, my, my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the, the concept here is where we get this concept of falling. Yeah. Right? And Adam and Eve, in the time of the original sin, they fell farther away from the Creator. Yes. And so my interpretation is that's why God is looking for them. Yeah. It's because they fell further away. They, God went to look for them here, That's but they weren't there anymore. Again, let me put it this way. Falling is not a problem. It's when you stay there, it's the problem. Right. And that what it means falling too far. You, mean, you could have fall and fall on your feet and keep yeah. keep going, right? They fall it, on their feet on their face and stay there. Is that is so is that indicative of naked and ashamed? Yes, exactly. That means that they fell exactly. and they stayed in that place. And, and that's what n- naked and ashamed. Guilt, yeah. What have I done? Right. That doesn't do much. So so if they would have just let's just paint this scenario. Yeah. So they, they 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 eat the apple because actually if you if you look in the Bible, it, Eve takes a bite of the apple and nothing happens. It's only after she gives it to Adam and he takes the bite is when this whole... <coughs> it's what we call the second bite. Right, the second bite. The first bite, always good. It's like when you have... Curiosity. A, you take a scoop of ice cream, right? So I'm just going to take a bite of the ice cream and you end up with the whole pint, right? Well, I, what people I take might... one drink, only one drink, and then you end up drunk, yeah. you know? Well, where, what, that's where it's come from. That's part of the tikkun. Well, what people might not understand there when we say second bite because it's one bite each. One bite Adam, one bite Eve, but they were one soul. It's the same thing. Exactly. So yeah. So just to clarify, it wasn't that it was two separate entities. It was two parts of one exactly. soul making the same mistake twice. So then we get to this point where God curses the serpent to eat dust all his days, and expels Adam and Eve from the garden to toil and labor, which we now understand God didn't expel them; they fell. To that place they had to leave exactly right the results here right again because i I'm, I'm also not using the word punishment because i'm also aware that this is a result this is an effect cause of, effect, our, exactly. of our decision making here but the punishment that the serpent infers which again also not a punishment serpent is cursed not punished right is that correct curse and punishment is different right right but it's a curse 
God curses the serpent to eat dust all of his days. Okay, yeah. Which is considered to be the worst curse found in the Bible, period. Is that correct? Uh, as far as what we understand. Right. So I'm mean, just saying, as far as the wisdom of Kabbalah goes, that curse for the serpent to eat dust all of his days is like the worst. By the way, it's, 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 it's a job that he's been serving, right? Being... Like we spoke about the opponent, yeah, it's yeah. the same idea. The snake, the opponent, the sitra acha. It's 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 different. It's one system that have many different purposes. Can, can we can we simplify it and say that the serpent it is the sitra acha? It is yeah, the other course. side. That's what the, I'm the, to ser say. the serpent actually is not separate from Adam and Eve. There's not two separate entities. It's within us, exactly. Right. It's just two sides of a coin there. All of these things only in, you know... So, again, I think it's some, that's a common misinterpretation between all religions based off of the Old yeah, Testament. Yeah, we think there's an, okay, someone... Uh, yes, there are evil. There is evil. There is negative forces. There is... This. But it's really based on your internal interaction with that. You know? You can, you can definitely interact with all the negative forces. What's the purpose? Where is it going to take you? And I see many people being busy with darkness and dark forces and negativity. It's like, why? Why you want to bring it to your life? Why you want to, would you like to bring that energy to your home, to your kids? You know? No, they cannot protect themselves. Why would I be busy with that? So a lot of people have been busy with Again, the same concept of once you turn on the light, what happened to the dark? It's like, who, yeah, who cares? You exactly. You just need to turn on the light. These forces, you don't need to interact with them. So you're saying you don't need dark forces to help you navigate yourself through the dark? For some, for exactly, that's for sure. But at the same time, the, like I said before, I think last time, can I appreciate sweet if I only have bitter? If I, if I never had bitter, right? Can I appreciate salt, uh, 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 sweet if I don't have salty? Can I appreciate that? Yeah, yeah. We need some time that, but it's to a certain degree. You don't have to go Adam and Eve, all the way down to realize, wow, what I had, you know. I, I guess the correlation I'm trying to make is that, number one, we're not really disassociating Satan from Adam and Eve. It's, again, just two sides of the coin. It's all existing as one consciousness. Yeah, yeah exactly. But yet, they, the result, the effect is different for both sides of the coin there. Yeah. So how do we get to, like, again, if it's one coin, how are we now extracting those two sides of the coin and saying, okay, this side of the coin is affected this way, and that side is affected that way? Because there's two different results, two different effects. Right. Adam and Eve are not cursed to eat dust all of their days. They just, again, fall further away from the... Ain't so the endless light. No, but that's what we learn in this world. Heaven or, or hell, right? Mm -hmm. Where is it? There are people in this world right now living like a hell mm -hmm. of a reality. And there are people in this world right now living like a heaven. Yes. How do you describe that? The same coin, the same world, the same reality. How is it possible? That's the idea of choices. That's the only choice that we have. So could we say that in the process of this falling, that these two sides of the coin were exposed on a much deeper level? Meaning that now, okay, th these are the options that we have. So your options just expanded. The, the result, the effects have expanded now. Because again, we're, we're being detailed that the serpent is going to eat dust all of his days, which we can then interpret and understand as now that there's no way for the serpent to receive light. Is that correct? Yeah. So the, essentially the curse of the serpent is you are, not, you are not connected to God at all anymore. It's over. Complete disconnection from the creator and the light of the creator. I, I, not, not much in the eyes of Kabbalah, right? Because... He is an angel who's serving a purpose. So what does that mean, to eat dust all of his days? First of all, let's understand one thing very clear from a Kabbalistic point of view. I gave an example this week, which I thought is, you know, give me a little bit of, of a much more depth. And it's very simple. Let's say if I take, you know, today, everybody's using... Um, initials, you know, like uh, apostrophes, right? Mm -hmm. To everything. Like abbreviations. Abbreviations, right? When you 
somebody send you hello well yeah like when the first time I got it it says what is lol what yeah. is, what, is lol? What, yeah. what, what does it mean right yeah or other things that people are sending you or formal emojis no 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 just words that makes no sense but they are just initials of words right now if you open the Zohar there's plenty of them right you, when you read in the Hebrew or the Aramaic you say that for example hey hey Dalet and then there is apostrophe or, or in Hebrew it's called Gershaim so you know it's not a word but it's an initial of three words does that make sense what I'm saying yeah okay so that particular one is Hadaw Dichtiv this is how it's written right so when I look at it I don't understand like first time I'm reading it I don't understand what do they mean by it's that? a very hard thing especially for someone who is not fluent in the language to figure out exactly so let's say I even I, I, I know the language very well right and it's, still it's like what does it mean by that you know yeah. or even I, I share with people you know in Kabbalah you see always the, the word Naran Chai it's like five letters right what does it mean you know go figure right so if you learn Kabbalah, you know it's Nefesh, Ruach, Neshama, Chaya, Yechida. Right. So it's called Naran Chai. Now, what happening here? I read it the first time, I don't understand. But when I discover what it is, there is a certain like, wow, that's yeah. great. Right? And from now on, every time you look at that, you don't need to call you're, everything. You're, you're, you already know. You're already LOL, not. FOMO, yeah. oh, eh, eh, whatever the letters that the people use. Mm -hmm. Right? When you look at the Torah, and the Bible, specifically the Old Testament, five books of Moses, yeah. it's all like that. So when you look at it and you read even the word Bereshit, Genesis, in the beginning, mm -hmm. it's all codes. It's 70 different codes in this world. Yeah. Go figure out. So when you read Garden of Eden, it's nothing to do with Garden of Eden the way we describe it. Right. Or the English translation for that. A translation of a translation. No, the way it's written, it's camouflage. It's a camouflage. It's an onion, onion. yeah. I, 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 so, what the Bible is doing? Tell me, tell me yes or no here. The Bible is essentially taking a very high level of consciousness that we as third dimensional beings just can't understand. So, it's translating that down to a level that we can comprehend. But behind that surface level are so many different levels of interpretation and consciousness that just go deeper and deeper and deeper. Like you were saying before, if, if, I, if I take your class and I listen to it, maybe I get nothing out of the first round. Yeah. Then I take it a second time, I hear something. Yeah. And it keeps going and going and going. And, and this is something which kind of you're referring to here, right? Is that there's layers to understanding the, the Torah. Yeah, and there's, there's just to know the beauty of that is not it's just reside within the story. It's within the secrets behind that. It's within the code. It's just a code. So I guess the answer that I was kind of picking at here and trying to get to was that actually the, these curses or these punishments, which we understand are not punishments, they're just a result of fragmentation. So, so now fragmentation is okay. going to happen on a larger scale. Okay. Right? The job is going to get more complex, more complicated, more moving parts to it now. Okay. That's why we're bringing in the concept of labor and toil and all of these things now. Because now here's a whole new set of problems you got to deal with in order to get back to the place that I just had you at. Yeah. Is this, is this kind of correct? The falling is leading us in a more fragmented direction. Yeah, it's almost like uh, I'm throwing you out on a trampoline. Your opportunity is to come back up. Yes. Or higher. Right. Do you understand? Right. So it's not about uh, I'm going and standing on a plane and giving a little bit down, but I know it's going to propel me up, right? You know, the question I had here is what is the difference between the Klipo, Shell, Satan, the Ego, yeah. uh, which are all part of the same side same of the coin. Same thing. But my question was were they created and developed simultaneously or were they developed with the fragmentation? The same thing as you as you saying uh, uh, the, the system of light, right? sharing energy everything is there it's just you know throughout our life we've been introduced to 
certain levels of that, but it's always there. Okay, but but th those levels of the Sitra Atra, the the other side, they develop along with us as we're falling in front. After, of yeah, exactly. Right. After so the falling of others. It's not that they're just all there, one shot together. They're developing with us and the side of the light, the other side of the coin. Yeah, for, but no. For example, for uh, kids 12 to 13, they have no power over it. It's there. It's with the system. It's them, you know. After that age, they have the opportunity to uh, uh, regain position over it, or at least uh, start to fight against that forces. We're speaking a lot about light, and it's a term that's used in Kabbalah frequently. Yeah. How do I understand what that means on a practical level? Very simple. Kabbalists he call it, it's a funny, you know, probably if you listen to class last night, uh, I mentioned it in, in depth. Um, we have to make a distinguish between what the Kabbalists refer to light or enlightenment. Or is light. Ha'ara is enlightenment. Okay? Take the sun. The sun is the light. The moon is... The reflection of that. Enlightenment. It's receiving its light from the sun. Meaning it's not its own light. Do you understand? Mm hmm Of my teacher, right? The, the teacher is the light. The student is... The enlightenment. Enlightenment. Do you understand the mm -hmm. difference? Mm -hmm. Now, what is the purpose in life? That each one of us become the light. So let's say, for example, if you study with me and you took it and only for you, you get enlightened, by the, but enlightenment have limitation. Until you take the enlightenment and you convert it into light. How? By turn around and share what I taught you. By becoming a source of that. You have become the light. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? That makes a lot of sense. If we understand that clearly, right, the, that system, the Creator wanted us, gave us the power to create, right? So we want to be able to do that all day long. Now, how do I know what the Creator wants for me? He sends you all day long. People don't even, some people, I mean, most people have no clue. All day long you get enlightenment from the Creator. Directly from the, the Creator. All day long. How does it feel? It feels like a certain feeling. Like, I feel that's what I need to do. Mm. Like, before you started this podcast, right? Two weeks ago, three weeks ago, whatever it is, a month ago, right? Where did you study that? The Creator sends you enlightenment. He said, let's see if he's going to grab into it. Hey, start something. Share with people, right? Do some interesting conversation. Boom. All this makes you feel like, wow, I, I think I should do that. You know, let me call, uh, uh, let me call Amazon, get some cameras and find somebody to, right? Right. That enlightenment, you converted into light. Now it's yours. And the Creator always, every day, every day, there's nobody in this world who don't get enlightenment. So would you, would you express this in a very simple way of saying that you, as an effect, become a cause? Yeah. 